block. Let's get started on time. So welcome everyone to today's uh, contributed talks session. So today we will have three experimental works. Uh, during the presentation, uh, if, I have, if you have questions, please uh, put your question in the Q&A box and we will read it for you later on. So for online audiences, uh, you can raise your hands in the Q&A session. So for our first talk, uh, we are pleased to have David from Italy, who is going to talk about time being QBD exploiting the conversion from and to polarization states with qubits based on temporal synchronization. Yeah, time is yours, David. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, nice. So, um, hello everyone, my name is Davis Lacombe, and I want to talk about this QBD experiment that we have done in our lab. So the objectives were to try to use uh, Iconiac, that is a correlation encoder to encode time beam states. Sorry, uh, David. Also, Sorry to interrupt sorry? you, but we cannot see your screen. We just see the other screen, but cannot see your slides. Oh, that's embarrassing. Sorry. Let me try again. It's okay. It's fine. Okay. What about now? Uh, we cannot see your slides. Uh, now, yeah, it's loading. Yes. Now, can. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sorry for that. So again, uh, we want to try to use the opponent, which is an operation encoder to encode uh, time beam states. Also, we wanted to try to use uh, factory pass interferometers, so interferometers that do not have uh, active components in the optical paths. And also, we wanted to try to remove the need of a, a system that shield the clock between the two hosts in the QED experiment. So this is the review of the experiment. Uh, it implements the three states, one that call efficiently b 4 protocol. Uh, everything here is made of optical fiber, components uh, uh, and some free space components of the transmitter. So let me introduce the Pontiac, that is the operation encoder we want to use. Uh, um, you know, this device provided with the diagonal um, input relative states can give a different phase shift to the two operation components that uh, came out to the output. And in particular, uh, with the scheme, we can generate the left right circular position uh, states and the diagonal states. So we can, with this device, and the three-state protocol I mentioned before. Uh, also, I want to introduce this scheme. It's a simple scheme. It's a max interferometer in which the input splitter is substituted by a PBS. So it's easy to see that this device can map directly uh, polarized states into time being states. And the same device used the other way around can be used to uh, translate time being states into polarization states in a probabilistic manner. As uh, the tips here, um, you can see that uh, the central beam of the of the state has two uh, orthogonal position states for the late early and early late states, uh, let's say at the measurement side. And we want to exploit this conversion uh, in our setup. So let me start to talk about the system. The uh, source is a DFP laser. Uh, which amplitude is modulated by an industrial modulator based on a sine loop. And to implement the two decoy states, then the light is uh, modulated into its polarization um, states with the iconiac. With a slight modification uh, that we add a half wave plate and a quarter wave plate to map the left and right circular polarization states into the horizontal and vertical polarization states. This way, we could use the iconiac to generate the uh, uh, b dimensional time being state using this uh, conversion state. And then the light is automated down to the single total level and sent to the quantum channel. Uh, at the receiver, the business choice is made passively with a fast access blocking bit splitter that sends half of the light directly to the SNSPD and the other half to the conversion state as I mentioned before. So um, at this point, the light is probabilistically um, uh, converted back into a polarized uh, polarization in code states that can be measured with this scheme here, the simple scheme made of a operation controller and a PBS. And here I want to stress out that the, the operation controller is needed both to select the basis and also to compensate the relative phase of the two interferometer. So as I mentioned, the two interferometer are totally passive and the phase is compensated here with this operation controller. Uh, the drawback is that this receiver has uh, polarization dependent losses and to mitigate this fact, we need to place at the input another political controller that the, as the only part was to keep the detection rate constant over time. Uh, the software, as mentioned, has this qubit-per-sync qubit algorithm at the receiver 
uh, and the back move can make us able to reconstruct the um, clock of the transmitter at the receiver side uh, using only the data of the receiver qubits. And the key generation is done instead uh, using the AIT QVD software. So we performed an experiment over a 12 hour uh, experiment using a 50 kilometer long fiber spool with additional 10 dB validation. And those are the average results. So the QBER in, uh, in mean is uh, under 1% in both phases. Uh, we achieved uh, an average SKR of uh, 60 kilobit per second and uh, with having a detection rate of 80 bits per second. Here you can see the, um, how it went. So uh, you can easily see that the fluctuation in the control basis are way greater because we need to actively compensate the phase instead in the key basis. Uh, there are no fluctuations, I mean, they are really smaller you know, compared to the other one. The same thing can be seen in the central plot, in which I plotted the distribution of the cuber for the two bases. And you can see also that the fluctuation in the control bases are reflected in the secret key rate fluctuation. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, we propose this QD system that is based on the conversion between prioritization and time beam states. It implements the three state one decoy protocol. Uh, we achieved a uh, uh, low cuber and uh, high stability over time because we inherited this property from the iconic uh, prediction encoder. Uh, most importantly, I think we do not need uh, any clock distribution system because we need this. Uh, we use this QB for sync algorithm, and we think this uh, scheme might be useful in all the cases in which the uh, polarization time beam states must exist, maybe for hybrid uh, free space and fiber channels. Um, there's a preprint for this work available here. You can uh, get the references, and if you have any question, uh, you're welcome. Yeah. So uh, thanks, David. Uh, great talks. So any questions from the on-site audiences or online audiences? So there's a question. Um, Emilia asks, "What is the benefit of converting the polarization?" into time bit for the transmission instead of transmitting directly the polarization into the channel? Yeah, um, uh, instead of transmitting directly the polarization is because uh, using fiber channels, uh, uh, we have to take into account the barrier fringes of the fiber channel. And uh, we need to compensate for these barrier fringes usually. And uh, instead using time and states, uh, there is no, there's no more this problem. This is the point. Thanks, uh, any questions? Any questions here in Taipei? Yes. Is there any question for audience, uh, online, uh, outside audiences? Okay, so maybe I have, I can have another question. So because I, I noticed, right, in your experiment setup, you are using the fax uh, axis blocking BS, right? Yeah. For the, for all the interferometers. So how about we just use the normal beam splitter? Will it affect the system? performance or implementation security of the system? Uh, okay, so please see uh, the input as a base selection uh, BS. Uh, a normal base splitter would introduce uh, a loophole in the security because this way, the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. because uh, this facility block in the splitter must be placed here, otherwise this thing won't work. And so this, this is why also here we need to use this splitter. I see, I see, all right, all right. Okay, so if there's no uh, any other question for David, then we thank David for the great talk. Uh, and we can, yeah, and we can go ahead and the next speaker is uh, Lorenzo from ID Quantic and University of Geneva, who is going to talk about the high efficiency and fast photon number resolving superconducting nanoware single photon detectors. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me well and you can see the slides. Okay. So, good morning, everyone in Taipei. Thanks a lot for uh, accepting me. It's an honor to be at QCRIP 2022. Um, so, I'm Lorenzo Stasi, and I will present you an high efficiency and a fast photon number resolving as So, the need for excellent PNR detectors has been continuous growth in the last decade in several fields of uh, quantum optics. So for example, if you want to generate a stream, a stream of true single photon, we can rely on an array of SPDC sources pumped in a strong regime and uh, 
PNR detectors can be used in order to filter out any kind of multiple variable that are going to be generated. Then PNR detector are not play in a linear optimal quantum computing in order to assess the final photon number, say at the end of the quantum operation computation. And also in quantum methodology, PNR can, detectors can be used in order to assess the purity of a single photon sources. One possible platform in which we can realize a PNR detector are the superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. As an SPD consists in a meandering nanowire, which is biased closely to the critical current. And when a photon arrives, it breaks some super pairs forming a resistive region, which expand up to the cross section of uh, the nanowire. And at this point, the current is redirecting to the external circuit and we can detect the, the photon. As an SPD has been proved to possess high efficiency, very low dark count rate, super low jitter and very fast recovery time on the order of nanosecond. They can be operated at very nice operating at, um, carogenic temperature, which reduces the complexity. And, but however, a single meander as an SPD have a limited PNR capability. This is why we are trying to improve it by using a multi-array architecture that is based on parallel as an SPD. So the idea is to have many um, smaller uh, nanowire electrically connected in parallel under the illumination area of the fiber here highlighted in red. And based on the number of the pixel, we can achieve the corresponding PNR capability. Then, in order to prevent electronic cross-talk due to the current redistribution after one of the pixels I've clicked, we have added in parallel all those nanowire which are outside of the fiber, so they cannot receive live, they can never turn resistive such that they have the task to accept this current redistribution so we can prevent the electronic stock and latching of the overall detector. And lastly, we have also optimized the gap between the peaks in such a way that thermal stock can be almost negligible. Here I show you some of the performances that a four pixel PNR parallel detector can, uh, can achieve. As you can see, we can arrive at more than 90% single photon detection efficiency with dark counts rates that, be, that assess only on tens of count per second. And no serious cost trace, you can see instead the clear PNR capability of such detector. And just by setting different voltage threshold is needed in order to retrieve the number of pixels that are clicked. Talking about recovery time, the parallel lessons we remain past uh, as in even even faster than a normal SNSPD with the 40 nanosecond recovery time to be back at uh, full efficiency. But the most interesting feature is that only after only 10 nanosecond, the detector is at 60% nominal efficiency due to the fact that uh, after one of the pixels of click, we still have three other uh, uh, pixels that can detect the new incoming light. Regarding the timing jitter, we remain in the tens of picosecond, and uh, the jitter possesses a, a nice uh, Gaussian shape, which means that the design does not affect the timing jitter performances of the detector. When we deal with, I'd like to be able to answer to this question. So, what is the probability to detect n photons when n photons are sent on the device? So, basically, connecting the photo counting statistic of the detector to the light uh, statistic distribution that we are sending. So what we did was developing a model that was able to um, map all these probability elements to detect n photon when m photon are sent on the device. And we use as variable only the single pixel efficiency. And then by this, I mean both the internal and uh, the geometrical coupling between the fiber and pixel. In such a way, we are not putting any constraint on the spatial light distribution and either on the pixel efficiency. Therefore, we can take into account imperfection during the non-fabrication process. Then we evaluate all the possible configuration for a specific event, so how many pixel, how many photons can end up on which pixel and which pixel can detect the light. We needed to do a step more since we do, didn't have direct access to the pixel because they are connected in parallel. So we need to run an optimization algorithm that find efficiency which minimize the Euclidean North. Then we are able to indeed retrieve the, such information. In, uh, here you can see the values. And uh, those values reflect uh, the Gaussian light distribution in single mode fiber. In fact, the outer pixels receive almost no light. And this is why their efficiency seems to be low. And then we can then obtain the um, fidelity probability, which are the probability to correctly evaluate the photo number state, which is arriving in the detector. 
and we can detect with the almost 50% probability a two photon number state, but then the fidelity drops due to the non resolvability of two photon in the same pixel. I'm going to show you two possible applications and I will reach the conclusion of my talk. So one possible uh, application of parallel SNSPD is to use it to reconstruct the input light statistical distribution of an unknown light source. So here, for example, I'll show you uh, the reconstructed input for Poissonian light with two different mean photon number profiles. And you can see the reconstructed input which is very well the expected uh, one. And another possible application in studies is, is um, use PNR in order to reduce the second order autocorrelation function measurement in SPDC sources. So we can use the parallel SNSPD as an heralding detector, and every time it uh, detects a multi photon per event, we can filter out those events, and you can see a 30% reduction in the G2 measurement. These are preliminary results obtained in collaboration with the group of applied physics at the University of Geneva. So in conclusion, I presented you a PNR detector based on the SNSPD technology, which in collaboration, which in um, that with our model can be used in a variety of quantum optics experiments. Thank you very much. And I will be pleased to answer your question. Okay, so there's a question. Uh, Vadim asks, have you considered cent central symmetric configurations of the sections? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, by doing that, of course, uh, uh, you will increase the, um, the fidelity probabilities. And uh, we are also trying to go towards the interleaved design such that we have a better splitting ratio of the light on each pixel. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, is it okay for Vadim? Okay, so maybe we can uh, answer the next question uh, first. So the next question is from Daniel Chufirov. So he's asking, uh, is there a way to minimize the time jitter even more in these systems? So this is a very nice question because uh, um, due to the fact that we have, uh, um, maybe we can go back to another slide here, exactly. So when one of the pixel click, as I was saying, we have this current redistribution effect to prevent the electronic stalk. So not all the current of the pixel is going to the readout circuit. So the signal to noise ratio is not as high as it could be for a, a single meander SNSPD. So the thing that we could try is even changing material. So going towards another kind of material that possesses a lower jitter. But um, like this, I don't see a way to pushing down the jitter even more because it's really limited by the, the, the electronic itself. Okay, so uh, the last question is from uh, Liang Yongchen. So is there, a, is there any system, a systematic way to improve the higher photon number fidelity? So the answer is yes, of course. I mean, here I just show you like a four pixel, but uh, if you imagine that you can go on you know, like up to 20 pixels, of course, the fidelity improve uh, more and more. And uh, as I was saying, trying instead of having like uh, split pixels, so one, two, and three, trying to go interleave, so in such a way that uh, like this, the, the splitting is done like one over n, which would end uh, as the number of pixels, we can really try to reach like 80% or 90% fidelity for each photo number event. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, thank you very much no for problem. the great talk. Thanks to you. Yeah. So maybe we can uh, go, go forward for the third speaker today. So we are pleased to have uh, Tim from Berlin, who is to, going to talk about autom automatically, uh, atomically thin single photon sources for quantum communication. Hello, can you see my slides and hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm Tim Gao from the Quantum Communication Systems Group of Tobias Heine from TU Berlin. And together with our co-workers at University of Oldenburg, we were investigating atomically thin single photon sources for quantum communication. You can find more details in our recent preprint. The motivation using practical quantum light sources in QKD is the following. So the problem is multi-photon events can leak information to an attacker. 
So only single photons are a usable resource for secret key generation. However, if we are looking at um, recurrent pile space systems, those are governed by Poisson photon statistics, which means that there is a significant fraction of either zero photons or multi photons, depending on the mean photon number. Single photon sources, however, can in principle reach near unity efficiency with a residual amount of multi photon events as given by this upper bound here. So far, semiconductor quantum dots and color centers and diamonds are the most mature platforms for this task. However, until this day, the challenging fabrication is one of a major roadblock for widespread applications. On the other hand side, 2D transition method decalcogonites, TMDCs, emerged as a new material platform which could allow for large scale and low cost device integration. In our experiments, we used a single layer of tungsten diselenite on a silver patterned surface. We have a surface with silver nanoparticles on which strain centers occur. And on these strain centers, a single photon, single quantum emitters can occur. We have our sample in a cryostat cooled down to 4.2 Kelvin in a standard confocal microscopy setup. With two long pass filters and a single mode fiber coupling, we can separate a single emission line at around 807 nanometer. And from off resonant pulse excitation, we can see that with a G2 of zero of below 0 0.5, that we have clear indication of single photon emission. We decided on a repetition rate for our system of five megahertz due to the lifetime of our emitter. Our emitter is then embedded in a QKD test environment to evaluate the parameters needed to estimate the secret key rate in full implementations. Therefore, we are setting the polarization with a linear polarizer and are investigating our results with a QKD receiver module with a passive basis choice 50-50 beam splitter for polarization encoding using two polarizing beam splitters for polarization discrimination. As detectors, we are using standard silicon APDs because in this wavelength regime, they have a really high efficiency. From our experiment, we need to extract this, the click rate, the mean photon number into the quantum channel, our G2 of zero value, and the quantum bit error ratio in our system. Depending on the excitation power, we can achieve click rates at up to almost 70 kilohertz. And the G2 of zero as an indicator for the multi photon emission probability goes down to 0 0.13. If we put these parameters now all into this asymptotic key rate equation, we can, ex we can extract expectation values for secret key rates and full implementations. As you can see here, although the mighty photon emission probability increases with increasing excitation power, the overall extractable secret key rate is at the highest at almost saturation power due to the higher click rate. So far, we have not performed any optimization. However, if we look at the photon arrival time 